November 2019, Seoul. Kim Wan, a journalist for the Hangura, receives a call from work asking him to check a tip-off sent via email. The informant warned Wan that the messaging app known as Telegram was being used to distribute illicit images and videos of minors within its groups. If you're not sure what that means, think of Facebook messaging or Twitter or Instagram DMs. You can have a conversation with one person but also add other people into the chat making it a chat room. Telegram is a freemium cross-platform cloud-based instant messaging service. Telegram is largely known for its privacy. All of the information is encrypted and every time you log out of the app, all of the content of your chats are deleted. Knowledge of illegal content circulating the internet wasn't new to Wan and initially he didn't think it was worth reporting on. Little did he know this tip would be the catalyst to expose some of the worst crimes committed in the country's modern history. The informant stated that the perpetrator was a high school student attending a prestigious institution who was likely seen as a model student. The anonymous whistleblower gave them everything down to his IP address. This made the story stand out to Wan and he published an article that night, not expecting much, just another story about illegal content going around the internet and the fact that the perpetrator had been caught. The following day, Wan was alerted to his personal information being leaked in Telegram groups. This included private photographs of his children from his Facebook. Fellow journalist Oh Yeon So was recruited to be part of a task force to investigate these groups and they began monitoring them. However, other email tips urged the journalists to turn their attention to the Baxa rooms, Baxa meaning doctor in Korean, deeming them to be worse than the other rooms. One informant who went by the alias Joker reached out to Wan to meet him and divulge what he knew about the Baxa rooms. Joker joined after a girl he knew confessed to him that she had been victimized by the group. Baxa, the owner, was seen to be godlike with the amount of control that he had. Lewd and explicit images of young women and girls would be watermarked with his name or phrases like Baxa's or Baxa's victim. The content was disturbing. Girls would be humiliated and inflicted pain upon themselves. Videos included them licking public bathroom toilets and floors alongside other bizarre and degrading acts. But who were these girls and why were they doing these awful things to themselves? Baxa would seek out these girls on mainstream social media such as Twitter, focusing in on those who were vulnerable due to their age or financial situation. He would offer them a job such as modeling gigs and ask them to move the conversation onto Telegram. Once there, he'd ask for pictures such as samples for modelling, most normal body shots and some more risque lingerie shots, as well as their ID and bank details to supposedly pay them. Once Baxa had their personal information, he would blackmail them to produce more explicit and extreme content, sending them photos taken outside of their homes or the phone numbers of their family members, saying that he would send the lewd images to them if the girl refused. Sometimes Baxa would add dozens of others into their chat to collectively harass and threaten the girl. Once the girl agreed, Baxa would take the content and post it into the Baxa room chat, selling the most explicitly for cryptocurrency girls could be forced to take upwards of 60 photographs an hour. The journalists noticed that some members of the Baxa room were asking to see Nth Room content. They found out an individual called God God had been engaging in similar activity for much longer and that Baxa was just a copycat. Their team also discovered reports on the Nth Room already existed. Team Flame, made up of Bull and Dan, were journalism students who wrote an article for a competition. They wanted to report on illegal internet activity. They discovered a site called AV Snoop, owned by a user called The Watchman. On the site, he had listed the Nth Room chats in order of 1 to 8. He also listed the videos in the content, alongside their personal details such as their name, address and schools, as well as the number of members in each group. Team Flame infiltrated the Nth Room chats and began monitoring them. Unlike the Baxa rooms, the girls were made to write phrases such as slave on them and other degrading terms, sometimes being forced to carve them into their skin with slaves. They were ordered to read aloud things such as, I am God God's slave. Extreme content included a girl being told to pierce her skin with a needle and thread and to hang things off of the thread. If the girls refused to do as they were told, content was shared to the group. God God claimed that 
in quotes, who obeyed his orders would not have their content shared, but survivors of this group think that is highly doubtful, and he was still selling that content elsewhere. God God would obtain material by posing as a police officer online and messaging girls with a phishing link, claiming that their private photos had been leaked. Once the girls clicked the link, he had access to all of their personal information. Team Flame worked alongside law enforcement, creating a telegram chat to share evidence. One user in particular sparked their interest, a man who went by Rabbit, who stated he didn't like girls under 12 and claimed he had content including children as young as 8. Both parties used information posted by Rabbit in the nth room chats to locate and apprehend him. But this was just one man, and he wasn't the owner of the nth rooms or the Baxa rooms. After Rabbit's arrest, God God went offline, claiming he needed to study for exams. The Hank Ura ran a follow-up article about their findings of them monitoring the chats over a period of two weeks, hoping perpetrators would be found and arrested. It made the front page of the paper, yet nothing came of it. There appeared to be no public response. Yet members of the Baxa room took note and reveled in the fame. Baxa himself changed his ID to the one the Hank Yura promoted. They mocked the journalists and more joined the group after the article was published. Baxa then uploaded a photo of a girl. He said he had named the girl the victim of the Hank Yura. The watermark on the image stated the Hank Yura's first victim. It was almost a threat that if the journalists continued to cover him, the more photos that he would post. Team Flame and the members of the Hank Ura task force felt defeated. Monitoring and reporting ceased until January 2020. However, the hashtag nth room case was getting traction on Twitter and noticed by Jiang Jie Wan, the director of Y Story, a TV show focusing on social issues aired by the SBS, Seoul Broadcasting Station. Similarly, those involved with Spotlight that aired via JTBC saw the issue, though some found it hard to believe. Why Stories J1 sent messages in the chat rooms stating he wanted people to reach out. Baxa himself reached out to J1, telling him that he was in Cambodia. On the other side, writer for Spotlight Chang Un Jo pressed them to cover the story after meeting with Kim Wan, and director Chui Quang Lee read up on the issue. They also communicated with Baxa, who told them he was in China, a claim he quickly changed when he said he had lots of free time. Quang Li pointed out that it was odd he wasn't busy, as at this time in China it was Lunar New Year. If you are unaware, Chinese New Year, also known as Xin Yuan in Chinese, is China's biggest holiday. It's very odd that you wouldn't be busy around this time of year. It's the equivalent of saying that you have absolutely nothing to do on Christmas. Knowing that he had just said a very suspicious thing, Baxa backtracked and said that he's actually in Cambodia. When communicating with J1, Baxa said that if the Y Story episode aired, he would have one of his slaves jump off the roof of the SBS building, taking her own life. Concerned, J1 spoke with Kim Wan, who believed Baxa was likely bluffing. And so the show aired on January 17th. One week later, a video of a girl whose head was covered in a plastic bag appeared in the Baxa room chat, the neck hanging from a doorknob. The person stated that she would end her own life by jumping off the SBS building at a specific time on a specific date. Baxa sent a message stating that if Spotlight aired their show, there would be another victim. Team Flame called Quang Lee urging him to reconsider airing the show. Despite this, it was deemed vital that the show aired for public awareness. Police were contacted regarding the threat at the SBS building. They only had an image of the girl's torso to go on, but they sifted through previous images sent in the chat until they found consistencies such as a bracelet the girl wore in the video where she stated she'd take her own life, until they found content with her face. Using that, they searched harder until they discovered one photo had a pile of books in the background, and one book had words on it. Her name. They found her school and from there an address. The police arrived at her home around 11pm to 12am and staked the area, ensuring no one tried to enter the building or that she left the building. They waited till morning to ensure she was safe and then they approached. She was living with her parents. 
In her room, they saw the rope tied to the doorknob like in the video and notes with phrases like Bax's lying around. The parents were informed of the situation and all the family were safeguarded. There was no Y story or SBS. During the airing of the JTBC Spotlight episode, members of the chat originally mocked it until they mentioned Bestcoin. This was the platform Baxa used to receive payments. The chat began panicking that they had been found out and would be traced, and Baxa tried to assure them. He began opening accounts on other cryptocurrency platforms, obviously unnerved by Spotlight's discovery. It was discovered Baxa used dumping to retrieve payments. He'd have someone withdraw the cash and leave it at a designated drop-off point. They managed to link Bax's telegram IDs to past narcotic and firearms cases, cases that also used the dumping method alongside two couriers who would drop off the money, Kim and Lee. Both had been charged with crimes unrelated to the Baxa room case. Neither man knew who Baxa was and they were given orders via telegram. They also discovered the ID of Baxa's number one accomplice, Buddha, a man known as Kang. I just want to take a moment to talk about the names that these men chose as their aliases. Baxa, Doctor, God God, Buddha. According to the 2015 South Korean census, Protestants made up 19.7% of the population, whereas Catholics made up 7.9%, meaning that the Christian God is recognized on a countrywide basis, with Protestantism being the first most popular religion and Catholicism being the third. Buddhism is the second most popular religion overall, with 15.5% of the population subscribing to that belief system. In 2019, when parents were asked what they would like their children to be, doctor was the second most popular answer just below government official. God and Buddha are phrases that we ascribe spiritual value to and give them power. Doctor is a profession that, especially in Asian countries, we ascribe value to and therefore elevates one's social status and maybe how much power they would have. These men have chosen phrases and titles from desirable, powerful positions. That was something that I picked up on and thought it was interesting to note when we're talking about this case and the type of people who were committing these crimes. One day, Baxa instructed Buddha to open a cryptocurrency account, withdraw the money and dump it. However, Buddha was already in custody for stalking a minor. He stated his role was merely an errand boy, collecting and dumping money, much like Kim and Lee. Several drop-off locations were given by Kim, Lee and Kang, also known as Buddha, and police narrowed them down to one, a fire hydrant station in an apartment building. During the month of monitoring this drop-off location, they noticed a girl on the CCTV was acting strange and tailed her. She would take a train and hand over money to a man on some days, and so they began tracking the man. After meeting the girl, he would meet up with another man at another location who would also give him money. This man was collecting money, not giving it away, meaning he couldn't have been just another errand boy. This was Baxa, and he was not in Cambodia. They managed to follow him to his address. March 2020, 40 officers staked him out on the day of the arrest. It was a painstaking mission because they had to get him at the right time. They needed him to be logged into Telegram when he was arrested, as when you log out, all the chats are wiped, destroying evidence, and they could not give him that chance. Over eight hours of waiting, they finally grabbed him after he was coming home from a bike ride. Baxa was Cho Ju Bin, 25 years old. He was sentenced to 42 years in prison in October 2021. He had a total of 25 victims between 2019 to 2020. They had caught the owner of the Baxa rooms. But God God, the owner of the Nth rooms, hadn't been identified, nor had he been online for months. Why Stories J1 was contacted by Team Red, a group of hackers who had been monitoring God God. They had contacted God God pretending to be a follower and sent him a link claiming SBS was collecting data on the Nth rooms. It was a phishing link. God God clicked it falling for a trap he himself had set up for his many victims. 
They found he was connected to public Wi-Fi using multiple devices. He used several Wi-Fi spots which the team used the radius of to pinpoint a common location. Using a list of suspects they already had, they managed to narrow down an address and learn that his father owned a scrapyard where he obtained the different phones. Police seized phones from the scrapyard, analyzed them and discovered his identity. God God was Moon Huan Wook, 24 years old. He was sentenced to 34 years in prison in November 2021. He had 20 years between 2017 to 2020. The creators of the rooms had been caught, but approximately 60,000 people were part of those rooms. Images and videos were sold to 2,060,000 IDs. As of December 2020, 3,757 people linked to the Nth Room have been arrested and 245 of those have been imprisoned. The confirmed number of rooms is 103, including 26 minors. There are likely many more. Nth Room content is still being shared on foreign messaging platforms and on the dark web. Cases like the Nth Room are still ongoing globally. China has been investigating its own case with sites uploading CP to 8.6 million members. First and foremost, I would like to thank the survivors of this case for being so brave and coming out with their own story. Guilt is a very common emotion to feel when you are a survivor of these cases and you are not to blame whatsoever. These men knew what they were doing. They were threatening you with your personal information. Do not feel guilty for what they did to you. I hope very much that you are able to get the help that you need to recover from this. Just know that nobody blames you. It is not your fault that you were placed in this situation. It is their fault for taking advantage of you. And you are so strong for being able to carry on with your life with what you have gone through, and that is so admirable. To the officers who were working on this case and the journalists who assisted with investigating, thank you so much for all the effort you put into this. It must have been so mentally and emotionally draining to have to look through all of that content, but you did it because you needed to identify the survivors and you needed to get these men caught. And we are very thankful for that. Overall, this case has been hard to look into. I obviously didn't want to give away too much of the detail of the content because it is disturbing and I wanted to respect the victims, so I only gave a couple of examples so you could understand what I was talking about. I'm aware that these cases aren't isolated. It is going on worldwide and I'm hoping by spreading public awareness, we can prevent these things from happening. We can see the warning signs and what to avoid when it comes to these types of people. But even more so, I hope that technology can catch up and we can find those who are already involved and stop them from doing it and save even more people. Please take care of yourselves. Please stay safe online. And if you are going through something, please speak up. You are not alone. You can talk to a friend, a family member, a teacher. There are organizations, some of which I will link in the description, where they can help you and they can provide you resources. There is a better life after this. Stay safe.